So thank you very much, Joao. It's a great privilege to be here today. And uh, it was amazing to see these patient uh, uh, cases that were presented to us, and great honor to share the stage with uh, Vasim and Halmi. Um, so first thing, before I start, start presenting uh, my story, you need to know three things, that I'm a biologist, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a bit as well of a dreamer. So I will be uh, talking about uh, my dream and how, as a tech company, we're going to make those technologies we've heard about much more available to democratize what we have called data-driven medicine. Prior to that, unfortunately, I need to start not with a dream, but with a kind of nightmare. And this nightmare is that since population is getting older, uh, according to Curie Institute, one people out of two in this room will get cancer. And unfortunately, unlike with AIDS, that's something that is very difficult to prevent with prevent prevention actions. So basically what we have to do is to manage better cancer and to make cancer as AIDS is today, a chronic disorder, a disorder we live with rather than a disorder we, dry, we die for, from. And that's really my dream. And I'm going to explain you uh, with six times that we launched this company what we have done to try to reach that dream. The good news is that with the number of data that we are producing today, and most of them being molecular information, so genomic data, we are ready today to spot mutations, to spot genetic variants that are behind many diseases. Cancers, but as well as we heard, rare disorders, which are 6% of, uh, the, of us who have such type of disorders. Now, we are not the only one who had that dream. Prior to us, and since we are at Wire, I had to take an advocate that made very clearly a statement that genomics would save people suffering from cancer. And this was Steve Jobs. You all know that Steve Jobs has been a very visionary entrepreneur. And back in 2007, when he suffered from pancreatic cancer, his tumor cancer had been sequenced. At that time, he cost about $100,000 and was among the first 100 individuals whose genome was sequenced. Unfortunately, at that time, we had little knowledge about cancer, about genomics, but still, Steve Jobs had the courage of telling what the future would prove to be right, that eventually one person would be the first, so himself, to outrun cancer, thanks to the sequencing of the DNA of his tumor, or eventually that he would be the last one to die, because at that time we wouldn't have enough knowledge about tumor profiling. Actually, what has happened since then? And we've heard some of it. We've heard a lot about the breakthrough in terms of DNA sequencing and how dramatically now the cost of producing such type of information has decreased. And indeed, Illumina even promises that we will have soon the $100 genome. But in parallel, there has been an, another breakthrough. And I think that's a breakthrough that here the tech people know more about and comes from the big data industry. We started to crunch much more digital data over the last 20 years. And by doing that, we've been able to build concepts, algorithms that are based on machine learning, pattern recognition, statistical inference, which in the end leads to artificial intelligence. And so our approach at Sophia Genetics is to leverage on such principles to make genomic sequencing ripe for clinical diagnostics and democratize this approach so that everyone in the world, not only in this country, everyone in the world could in the future benefit about such type of great technologies. So the key question to do that is in the end, how one can democratize such a complex uh, disease management, right? You've heard uh, about experts who tell you that, you know, you need to manage data production, you need to manage uh, data uh, analytics, you need to manage even follow-up of treatment of patients, and that's very, very complex. How are we going to ensure that everyone got the right diagnosis everywhere in the world, how are we going to ensure that this leads to right uh, uh, treatment? In other words, how are we going to ensure that we democratize this approach? I think that's the key question. And this is a question we wanted to solve when we launched the company in 2011. I'm going to take on stage with me someone I respect very much, and this is Barack Obama. A year ago, Barack Obama made the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative at the White House. And at that time, he explained us, you know, very simply, how thanks to genome sequencing, we are moving into a digital era of medicine. And that the problem was not anymore about producing data, but the problem was about being altruist, 
And that for this, what was required is that we would create a collective intelligence. And creating this collective intelligence requires few things, in fact. It's not about technology. It requires that we connect hospitals that are producing those data. It requires that hospitals that are connected pull data in a single system. It requires that the experts in the hospitals share their expertise about the treatments they are giving, about additional information they have about the patient. And by doing that, we can dream to move into an era where with artificial intelligence, we can leverage on this data for the benefit of all. And this has been exactly the approach of Sophia Genetics. I will explain you a bit more about our artificial intelligence that in 2011 was not existing. As you know, an artificial intelligence needs to be built bottom up. Self-driving cars will learn from us. We learn from all the hospitals that have been working with us. And today, the network we've been building is, I think, what Barack Obama was talking about. We've been able to connect 257 hospitals across 45 countries, even some being in Africa, even some being in Latin America. You imagine, in, in an industry which is so complex. And our technology is being used every day by about 600 experts, pathologists, geneticists, biologists, that are going as well to integrate knowledge in the system so that based on machine learning techniques, you can learn on how they report the cases to kind of simplify the reporting of other exp experts in other countries that may have less knowledge. So to do that, the secret sauce has really been our artificial intelligence. And I like to take the example of Swiss watches. We are a Swiss company. What we did is that we spent 30 million to go into the details of the data. We just didn't want to have a nice watch. We wanted to have a watch which was precise, as precise as a Swiss watch in terms of mechanics. And to do that, we had to make a heavy effort and work on the raw data that are being produced by NetGen sequencing, not only the data that are being computed by the hospitals independently, but those raw data. And why is that? I'm going to present you here something that is pretty complex, and I'm going to try to explain it to you. What you do see here is the output of an Illumina or Thermo Fisher next-gen sequencer. And what do you see is the information of the patient that has been produced, we call it reads, that has been aligned against what we call the genome of reference. And here, as you can see, there is a lot of color. This color tells you that there is noise. These are unexpected events. And there are many, many unexpected events. In the past, what people would do using simple bioinformatic principles is that they would trash this noise. And they would consider only the clean side. Well, that's a mistake. Because actually, this noise can tell you what's happening there. But for this, you need to understand. You need to be able to infer the information about this case. In this case, what has happened is that in this gene, which is very well known, BRCA2, related to breast cancer, there has been a viral element that has been integrated in the middle of this BRCA gene. And this has, as a consequence, led to this high level of noise. But unless you're able to understand that noise, you don't know that there has been this viral element that has been integrated into this gene. You don't know that this gene is broken, and you don't know that the patient may have a high risk of developing breast cancer. So that has been the approach we've taken from scratch, digging deeply into the data that are going out of those machines. To do that, we, we actually wanted to build trust. Because exactly as Helmi explained, you know, those technologies are emerging technologies that are going to completely transform the way we are diagnosing patients today. And unfortunately, for a long time, as it was discussed as well by the person from Genomics England, sample management can be a problem. From our side, we decided again to take a tech approach and to accept the diversity of data production, to accept the fact that maybe some samples will not be right, and rather than standardize it from the lab level, standardize it from the data analytics level, solving the patterns using statistical inference to bring every hospital at the highest sensitivity specificity possible independently of what they would have on hand. The other thing we need to build we, we did to build this trust, as we have been building a network, is that we have invested as well in data privacy, data security. And we believe that's very important because one of the risks that this industry may have is this credit. And if there is a lack of, leak of information regarding patient data, this may kind of delay as well the adoption of such type of technologies and may delay as well the ability of people about sharing data. 
So today, this intelligence can not only enable uh, proper clinical genomics testing in the advanced hospitals, university hospitals, in countries like in UK where we are working with about 10 hospitals, but can help as well every patient everywhere in the world. And that's something I'm very proud of. And this is because through our SaaS platform, where our artificial intelligence is acting as the engine, the hospitals that are in emerging countries can as well get access to the sequencing capacities of the bigger hospitals that are producing patient samples that have adopted our technology. So in other words, we've been able to democratize that aspect as well, just giving to the emerging countries access to the capacity of the advanced countries in terms of data production. So hospitals working today with us are helping thousands of patients. I will show you some numbers. And they do that in rare disorders where they may analyze a full genome, as it has been shown in some cases, it's very important, but as well in cancer, where it's much better to target a number of genes because otherwise the information you will get will be like a, a Swiss cheese full of hole and you're not going to be able to properly diagnose <laughs> patients. And today for us, we are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big day because it's a day where we're are for the first time announcing a milestone that we set since we launched the company. This quarter, we're going to hit the 100,000 genome profile. So our artificial intelligence at the end of this quarter will have supported the diagnosis of over 100,000 patients that were diagnosed through next-gen sequencing through a genomics approach. And for us, that was a big milestone. So in, in the world of today, with the network we've built, uh, actually, the network is very powerful, but we are limited by something. And that is that we don't have all the data that could be useful on the top of genome information to really move into this era of what we call data-driven medicine. And here, as it was done in the, in, in the previous talk, I encourage actually you know, hospitals to share information about tumor type, tumor stage. And more than that, treatment that was given to a patient and success rate of that treatment. Because if you have this metadata, the molecular information, the network, then I think this leads you to a new era of medicine, an era that we call an era of real-time epidemiology, an era of where I think we're going to be able to uh, consider that cancer is a chronic disorder because we will be able at the time of diagnosing a patient to tell that patient, your cancer looks like the one of 10,000 other patients among which 10% did receive this treatment plan A and survived. And this is my dream. Thank you very much. Thank you.